I want to focus on our second word this morning, which is the word equip. And uh, I believe that we are in a time in a season where you as the believer must recognize your call and purpose, first of which is to be conformed to the image of the Son. That is the highest calling of the believer. It's not to be a prophet, apostle, pastor. It's not to be the greatest doctor in the world. It's not to be uh, the, the greatest dad or mom. That, that's not our highest calling. Our highest calling is to be conformed to the image of the Son. That is our highest calling. And one of the things that we must understand is that He is the chief priest. He is the cornerstone. And we are all called to be priests unto God. And so the title of this morning's message is Everyone a Priest. Revelation 1.6 that we've read this morning. See, the key to transformation is understanding who Christ is. And if we understand who Christ is, then we, we adjust our identity to be like Him. I think for too long we've had a, a culture that's all about figuring out who you are. Right, and so we have thousands of self-help books, and we have thousands of these, uh, you know, motivational speeches. And here's the ten steps to overcome narcissism, and here's this, and here's that, and and here's all of. I, listen, I, I I have a degree in psychology. I I love the way the the brain works, but at the end of the day, man's way of figuring it out isn't going to adjust you. It's getting into the image of the sun. It's when we when we die, no one ever wants to die. Right? I mean, it, death is an interruption. If we, if we understand, death is an interruption to intention. Death was never meant to be the modus operandi of humanity. That, that was never meant to be part of the human experience, and yet it is. And so we understand that death is an interruption to intention. But if we would learn to die to ourselves and learn to live in Him, then you can't threaten me with death because I'm already dead and alive in Him. Amen? And so, so we've got to understand this, that we are all called priests unto God. Revelation 5.10 says, You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. That's talking about you and I, that someday we will walk in a rulership with Christ. We will reign with Him. That, that's altogether amazing and scary, all wrapped up in one. I'm thankful that those who reign with Him will be redeemed. Hallelujah. Because if some people got some authority, they'd mess it all up, right? I mean, we see that in, in the kingdoms of the earth, that the minute someone gets some power, it goes to their head. In that day, we'll be so fixated on the one who is, it's not going to go to our head. Hallelujah. One of the greatest truths, I think, for the Christian, and was actually the basis for the Reformation with Martin Luther, is that we as individuals are priests unto God, that each one of us has a right and an access to God through Christ Jesus. Prior to that, it was the idea that you had to go and have a mediator through man. And we've learned that Jesus is our great mediator between God and man. I'm so thankful for that, that I don't need to go to man to find Jesus. That, that I get to have a relationship with him all by myself. And yet we'll learn that we also need each other. It, it's both and. But the entire Protestant movement was based on this concept. And, and while there were some really bad theologies that came out of the Protestant movement, there was some really bad replacement theology that uh, totally does away with Israel, and that's wrong, and, and totally heretical. And there were some other you know, flaky things that came out of it. The greatest gift that the Protestant Reformation brought us was that we could have access to God on our own through Christ Jesus. And I'm thankful for that. Amen? And so... The, the, the problem is that the Reformation honestly didn't go far enough because it, it, it still created this idea of separation between clergy and laity. It, it has this idea that clergy are greater than the laity. Listen, we are all equal at the cross. I'm not greater than you. You're not greater than me. The cross is the great equalizer. And because of the cross, we are all made equal. Now, while we all have different roles to play, we must understand we are all called to be priests unto God. I am preaching this morning, and I might be preaching to myself as some of you stop being the frozen chosen. Cold has come to Texas, and everyone has turned into a popsicle. That's okay. There's fire on this altar. Hallelujah. But I think one of the things is that we've, we've created this idea, especially in the Western culture, of professional ministry. Right? I mean, you're, you're not really a minister unless you're a full-time minister. Unless you get a paycheck from a 501c3, you're not really a minister. And, and there's been this separation that is absolutely disgusting. And what it's done is it's disempowered the believer from being a believer. 
because we almost expect that the, the professional ministry, where the clergy hold a dominating and powerful position, subjugate the laity and hinder them from entering into the purposes of God for their lives. I grew up in a little thing called the shepherding movement. Anyone ever heard of the shepherding movement? You couldn't breathe without the permission of your pastor. If you wanted to get married, you had a council of elders that would decide if your spouse was the one for you. And if they said no, you didn't have a choice. It was insane. Now, some of you are like, oh, I don't know what that's like, but I know what my parents are like. Similar. Hallelujah. But, but there's this, this power play that's taken place, and even after nearly 500 years since the Reformation, people still look to the clergy as though they have special God access. I don't have more special access to God than you do. And I think that's one of the things that unfortunately has happened, and, and the Pentecostal movement unfortunately, reinforce this concept. I'm, I'm laying a foundation here this morning. We're going to go somewhere. The high-powered ministry producing these prophets who walk in great power, so they are the anointed ones of God. Listen, I've met some intercessors that no one's ever heard of that hide in a back room of prayer who have more anointing on their life than some of these prophets that run around selling their, their ministry. I, I mean, preaching ministry. I, whoops, I might get in trouble. But they, they have this idea that, that they're far advanced, more spiritually. And then we see the attitudes of many Christians. Well, I need the pastor to pray for me. As though there's some special blessing when the pastor prays. God moves in special ways when the pastor ministers. We only like it when Pastor Jacob preaches. Come on, don't worship me, church. We, we have to understand the truth is this. We are all ministers of the gospel. Every single one of us are ministers of the gospel. And, and we are all called and capable to minister both to God and to one another. And so the question then, well, is there room for professional ministry? Is, what is the role of, of the, the five-fold ministry? Well, let's look at a scripture together that we actually, when we chose the name Equipping Church, this became paramount to our call as a church. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. We may never bring back the projector just so you'll bring your Bible to church. Hallelujah. I read a great story this week. This pastor had come over to visit a couple in his church. And uh, they had a great time together. And at the end of the night, the wife turned to the husband and said, I think pastor stole one of our silver serving spoons. And the husband says, Pastor wouldn't do that. She says, no, it, it's, it's not in the box. It's always in the box. We didn't even take it out. It's out of the silver box. It's not in there. Our pastor wouldn't do that. So it just, I mean, it bothered her all week. So finally, she goes to church on Sunday. And unbeknownst to her husband, she goes up to the pastor. And she says, Pastor, I have a question for you. Did you by chance happen to take the silver spoon out of the box that was on the table? And he said, dear sister, had you opened your Bible this week, you would have found it. <laughs> so y'all know, if you invite me for dinner. <laughs> Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. That was a bad joke. <laughs> but the sheep laughed, which made it badder. <laughs> and he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. Verse 12, here is the key for the equipping, equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. It is the equipping of the saints. That's the role of the fivefold ministry. It's not my job to pontificate powerful principles of piety. Some of you caught that alliteration this morning. It is my role as a fivefold minister to make sure that you are equipped to do the work of ministry. That you are fulfilling your individual call as a believer, being a believer, a priest unto God, and a minister to all people. That's our role. That, that, that's the, the job of the fivefold ministry. It's not this weird seven mountain theology that apostles are going to sit on mountains around the world and rule the world. That's not what it's about. The call of the apostolic, the prophetic, the evangelistic, the pastoral, and the teaching gifts are to equip us to become like Jesus and minister the gospel in every sphere of society. It's not some weird stuff that's out there, y'all. 
God graces and gifts people for this role. And so the role is to be an equipper, a motivator, a director, an adjuster. I had a prophetic word this week. God's calling you to be a prophetic chiropractor. You'll bring adjustment to the body of Christ. Oh, thanks. That's exactly what I want to do. Hallelujah. But if we begin to understand that, if, if we're looking at the word equip this year, if we begin to understand that, then it actually helps us understand how we approach our Sunday services. Why do we gather on Sundays? Well, Sunday services fulfill two functions. Number one, this is a place of corporate celebration and encouragement. When we gather together, it's a celebration of believers, of what God has done in our lives. It's a place of encouragement, of connection, of building one another up. And it's a place of equipping. That what gets preached, whether it's me or whoever's behind the pulpit, it's an environment for equipping. And I want to deal with those two things this morning. Number one, providing a place of corporate celebration and encouragement. Praise and worship. How many of you love to worship this morning? If you don't, we'll cast the devil out and we'll get you free and you can start worshiping Jesus freely. Hallelujah. We need to love worship. It enables a celebration and joy to be expressed corporately around the goodness of God. I mean, if we just, I mean, he's so faithful. We start singing, you satisfy my soul. And and that should be the truth of our life. It shouldn't just be words that we sing. When we come to this place corporately, it should be this place where corporately we've gathered together, each carrying the testimony of what God's doing in our lives, even if it's been a week of hell. Listen, I recognize that sometimes you showing up on a Sunday is a testimony. Can we be real about it? I saw, I saw another little meme thing this week. Facebook has all sorts of ridiculousness, but this one was actually pretty good. It said that this guy, and I can't remember his name, he said, you know, when I was late to my AA meeting, they celebrated that I showed up because they knew I made it. But when I'm late to church, I get looked bad at. Now, do I think we should practice tardiness as a lifestyle? No. I don't think that should be our lifestyle. But, but I think it, it rec- sometimes just getting through the door, that's a testimony. Sometimes coming into a place with people we don't know, why are they lifting their hands? What language is that guy speaking up there? I don't know that language. I mean, it it can be different. It can be a testimony just walking in the door. And I think we have to recognize that. But I think we also have to recognize that when we gather together, we're declaring corporately the goodness of God. And there's something that happens in the corporate encounter. Prayer and ministry takes place to heal and encourage one another as we face those pressures of life. Preaching to motivate and to equip and to teach in order to better prepare us all for our service unto God. But can I challenge you with something this morning? You shouldn't come to this place empty. Some of us will, inevitably. We will have had a hell hell of a week. That's There we go. You will have a hellacious week. It just rolled right out. Listen, some of us have had those weeks. And, and when you're going through stuff like that, sometimes you're going to show up empty. But imagine if, let's say, 95% of us came full and overflowing on a Sunday morning. See, I could hand out a, a, a coal to each of you. I could hand you one of those little things that we barbecue with. And, 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 and we could light it on fire and you could carry your own together. It produces a little heat. Right? You're, you're stewarding your own flame. But what happens when all of them get put together? What ha- it gets hot. There, there's something that happens when, when my fire begins to connect with your fire. And, and it, it begins to burn together. I love what Spurgeon said. He said, light me on fire so the world can watch me burn. But what happens when you're burning and you're burning and you're burning and we're connected together? That's the flame of revival. That's where God's moving. It's, you can't carry revival on your own. And you can't carry the fire of God on your own. Because eventually, if you remove that coal far enough from the fire for long enough, what happens? Goes out, gets cold. Becomes to no effect. It's not doing anything. But you know the other thing that is incredible about those coals? Eventually you can't tell them apart. 
When they're burning together, they become conformed to one image. You want to be like Jesus, you have to be connected to other people. You want to be like Jesus, you got to burn with other people. You can't do it on your own because you'll fizzle out and you'll get blown away. But God continues to add to the fire. Every soul saved is another ember to the fire. Every person that gets connected to the gospel is another ember in the fire. And when we burn together, we produce the image of Jesus. That's what the corporate encounter is all about. And so when we come empty, because we've not been feasting on the Lord all week, then the few that might come full, then they're really having to work. Hallelujah. That's why I need a nap on Sundays. <laughs> but you can tell the difference when people are coming in tired and weary and worn out and don't want to be here, disengaged from worship, or when we come in full and hungry, expecting to meet God in this place because there's a difference in the atmosphere. There's a difference in the atmosphere. If, if you go to a football game expecting your team to lose, I know some of them are just going to lose. It's going to happen. Like, I won't name names because I, I want to stay the pastor here. But there's two over here naming names. But, but I mean, you, you go with the expectation. Even if you know that your coach is terrible, even if you know your quarterback can't throw, I was not mentioning that team from the north. But if, if you go, you still go with the hope of a win, right? You're, we're still, when we're coming to the corporate encounter on a Sunday morning, we're coming with the hope of a win. We're coming with the hope of a, an encounter with God. We're coming with an expectation. I've got to, I, I remember as a kid, there, there was an excitement before I even got to church. Because there was, there was something to be said about a group of hungry people. And I'm talking about a church where when I was a teenager, we had oil that came up out of the carpet. Like there was an anointing flow that happened and people walked through the oil and got instantly healed. I'm talking about a, a, a church where the, the intercessors were so hungry for God that we were praying one night. And God literally picked us up in the air and moved us to the other side of the building. And you're like, why did that happen? It was a prophetic sign of the transition that was coming to the church and revival broke out. I'm talking about hunger, that, that the people were so loving and loved God so much that when this woman walked in, who we thought was a woman and wasn't a woman, she came in, got encountered by God and showed up as a man the next Sunday because God instantly delivered him. I'm talking about a place where God shows up because people are hungry to meet with God. They're not coming for religious ideologies. They're not coming to check off the list. They're not coming to pay their tithes. They're coming because they're hungry for God. And they know that I can catch fire if there's some burning people. So you might be the one this morning who's saying, listen, my flame's out right now. Let me tell you, there's some people in the room who have the flame of God burning in their life. But how much more? Because then what happens if we catch fire and we go out those doors... You'll burn long enough to, to get someone else on fire. Hallelujah. And so we've got to understand that the, the, the corporate gathering isn't just to check the list off. It's because there's fire in the place. It's a place, that second point is a place of equipping. We seek to provide an opportunity to learn, to experiment, to function in a safe environment so that when we're ministering to one another outside of Sundays, we've gained some effective skills. Sundays are not a performance we attend. But it's an exciting encounter both with God and one another to better prepare ourselves for expressing our own individual calls. And the result of this thinking is that the real nitty gritty of ministry shouldn't happen on a Sunday morning. This isn't where real ministry happens. Real ministry happens out there with the suicidal neighbor. Real ministry happens out there in, in the Walmart. The, the real ministry happens on the phone call. The real ministry happens out there. You come here to get equipped and to catch some more fire so you can go be a minister. Ministry is not a license. It's not an ordination. Ministry is an identity that you received the minute you got born again. You became a priest unto God because of His blood, because He rolled away your sin. You have every right to stand before Him and talk to Him and walk in relationship with Him. And because you have that, you have a responsibility 
to be a minister unto God and unto people. The real ministry happens when we each function in our priesthood. Do you understand that? That's where real minute, when we function in our priesthood as priests unto God. It's the reason why small groups of the church are so crucial. Listen, we, we can't just come on a Sunday and then stay disconnected from the body. Small groups are essential. They're crucial. I know that what Pastor Anna is bringing on Thursday nights to the ladies is so powerful. Hallelujah. Pastor Jacob, whoever he is, he's trying with the men. I told Ben, and I don't think he caught this, but I was meeting with Ben on Friday, and I said, listen, I don't lead a men's group really well. And he goes, yeah. I mean, he didn't catch it when he said it, but I went, yep, he just affirmed everything I believe. It was hilarious. But, but when, we under- <laughs> when we understand that we have to have relationships outside of a Sunday morning, we've got to build those relationships. We've got to walk together. It's in the small groups where real ministry takes place, where I get to learn, because I may not learn about your need on a Sunday morning, but when I'm sitting across from you, and I can tell you're having a rough day. What's going on? When we can share our prayer requests together, like, this is what I need God to do in my life. This is what I'm believing God for. We get to then begin to build, and we can actually... I had a text from a friend last night, and he said, I, I, I'm going to ask you to pray. We're, we're going through a certain situation. And I said, oh, I've got faith for that, because I've seen God do it this time, this time, this time, this time, this time. And I just rattled off all these testimonies of our voice text. I said, here's what I've seen God do, blah, 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 blah. And he goes, man, I've got faith for it now. I actually believe God can do it because when we get to share the testimony of what God's done in our life, it's a little more flame. It's a little more fire. It just begins to burn a little bit more. We become more encouraged. It's in these places where body ministry can effectively function because, listen, I'm not called to pray for all of you all the time. You need to pray for each other. I'm just trying to survive my own week sometimes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's why I'm so glad that I can lean into people like Hector and say, Hector, I need a little bit of your fire today. I need a little bit of that faith, that, that faith for finances. I, I need a little bit of that faith for this. And, and then I can lean into someone else. And, and, and when we do that, it builds us up. Small groups also provide an effective platform for evangelism. It enables the gifts of the Spirit to be expressed to those in real need. You might know some people who won't show up on a Sunday, but they'll come to someone's house and eat Pastor Hector's charcuterie. I don't know what the ladies serve. I know Pastor Anna serves meat, but I don't know if y'all eat food. Like, but even more, when we fully understand that Ephesians 4, 14, and 16 says this, as a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up. Can I say to the Western church, grow up in all aspects into Him? What are we called to grow up into? Into Him. We grow up into Christ, conformed to the image of the Son. I tell you, some of the foolishness I hear, I'm like, Jesus, just give them the fivefold. From whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of love in itself. Can you recognize that? The crucial concept? It's the body of Christ fitted and held together by what every person brings. I'm an incomplete body without you. You're an incomplete body without me. Listen, I don't know what parts you play. Some of you might be the kidney. Some of you might be the big toe. I don't know. But we need every part. Listen, if you don't have a big toe, you lose balance. So everyone fitted and held together by what every person brings, requiring the proper working. You have a role to play. You need to be equipped for it. Some of you are called to to quote unquote professional ministry. There's nothing professional about me, y'all. I just make it. Hallelujah. Just surviving by the blood of Jesus and the word of the testimony. But some of you are called to that. That's why we're launching the Ministry Development School. 
If we had a projector this morning, I'd put the slide up, but we don't. Hallelujah. But third Saturday of every month, starting in February, 10-month commitment. That's not a whole lot. Like five hours once a month, you can do that. Some of you spend more time watching Netflix. Oh, I felt the... Oh. But when we get equipped, so some of you might be called to ministry. That's a great place to get plugged in. Some of you might be called to worship. Connect with Ben and Claudia. Talk. We have a process. We don't just let anyone on the stage, but we, we have a process. And wasn't that so great? I mean, 1990, right there. Hallelujah. I'm amazed we still have that thing. But see, the, the emphasis is not on what the professional ministry supplies, but what each member brings. Like do we do we, it's about every part of the body supplying something. And the result is when each member begins to function, personal freedom and blessing begins to result and suddenly Sundays become more relevant and impacting because we gain further empowerment in our priesthood. My one of my spiritual moms Jill Austin, she's gone on to be with the Lord. And listen, she she was one of those hype preachers. She 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 hyped people up. Drove me crazy sometimes. She, I mean, she'd walk to one side of the room. Are you a 50-watt light bulb or a 100-watt light bulb? And then she'd come to this side. Oh, I think this guy. I mean, just uh, anyways. But she would talk about wet blanket Christians. And, and some people, I mean, they just are. They just walk around. They're Eeyores. Well, I'm thankful to be saved. Praise the Lord. But, you know, nothing else has gone right. I guess I should just die and go on to heaven. Have you ever met someone like that? I have. I just want to lay hands on them. Come out, Eeyore. Barbara can testify. She's a tigger now. Hallelujah. But see, when we begin to understand that, because we have the concept that each member is a minister, every motivation changes, especially as we seek to become better equipped to fulfill the call of God. We no longer attend church because it's what we're supposed to do, but because we have the need of equipping and encouragement. Ben, I'm going to ask you to come. I'm going to start to close. I didn't say I'm close. I'm starting. I just I don't want to be a liar. Here's the practical consideration, though. The enemy doesn't want you to be in church. Can I just tell you, right? He does not want you to be in church. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says this. Actually, I'm going to 23 through 25. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope. What is our hope? He's coming back. Hallelujah. That is our hope. Our hope is that the king is returning. So let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. But verse 24 says, And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Verse 25. Not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And if you go on in Hebrews there, he equates forsaking the assembling to sinning. He says, for if we go on sinning, if we go on doing these things, if we keep being removed from everything, talks about all sorts of judgment that comes. I don't, I don't want that judgment. But see... Can I tell you, some of the greatest fights you'll ever have will be a Sunday morning. You'll get nauseous every Sunday morning. All of a sudden, all the anxiety that you haven't dealt with all week shows up on Sunday morning. All of a sudden, your favorite show gets moved to 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. I don't even think there is live TV anymore, is there? I don't know. But we... We start to have that complacency settle in. Oh, I'm not going to miss anything if I don't go. It's no big deal. I've seen it all before. Anyone ever thought that? And then you hear about what happened that Sunday. And then the enemy goes, see, because you weren't there, God moved. The enemy works like that. Because he doesn't want you connected to the body. If he can cut you off from the life flow. If he can stop your involvement. We must determine 
our absolute commitment to not forsaking the fellowship. Can I tell you, I, I believe this with every part of my being, there will be a day in this country where this will be illegal. I, I really do. I, I think that is, if, if the Lord, we used to say in Pentecost, if the Lord should tarry, the Lord doesn't return. I, I think we're headed for some real persecution in this country. Or it's going to be really difficult. Now, we live in Texas. It can take a little bit longer here. But we, see, we saw it with COVID. How easy it was for the government to just shut down church. And in some places, keep it shut down for months and months and months and months. Absolute craziness. And so I think we have to recognize that the enemy wants to keep you out. But if we would begin to come each Sunday, recognizing. Listen, I, I prepare my message earlier in the week. I, I spend my Saturday night praying for the corporate encounter. I might review my notes. I might finish some of it up. I might add some things. But as I'm in here on Saturday nights praying, I'm praying over every chair. I'm laying hands on every chair. I'm calling each person who sits in the chair into an encounter with Jesus. I'm, I'm praying that you'll be full. That when we gather together, your faith will connect with my faith and your faith and your faith and there'd be an explosion on a Sunday morning. That's what it's all about. Is that we would come, we would celebrate, we would encourage, we'd get equipped. I want to say to you this morning, we're, we're going to receive communion in just a few minutes. We're also... I just want to prepare you in advance. The last Sunday of this month, uh, so whatever that is, I think it's the 28th. Again, I don't have 28th. 28th, we're going to receive a special offering uh, that I want you to begin to pray about because we have some little guys that need to be equipped and they need some space to be equipped. And so we're going to trust God either way. We're going to get a building put back there. We're already in the process of doing it, creating some space. But I want to call you into partnership there in faith. Practically, if we had 30 families, give $1,500, it'd be done. It'd be done. And that would be doing the best. I want you to begin to pray into that. We're going to create a way to pledge that. We'll show you a way to even do recurring giving for that. But part of equipping this year is we want to make sure that the next gen is equipped. And, and it's not just going to serve them. It's going to serve other purposes. We'll be able to have smaller meetings back there without having to turn all this on. Be able to, there, there's just so many purposes that it's going to serve for our community. And so I want you to begin to pray into that as we equip the next generation. And I, I personally believe we'll quickly outgrow that. But hallelujah, it'll be a good investment. We can never go wrong investing in the dream of the next generation. And so we're, I don't like cliches, but we're going to call it dream builders. That's what this whole campaign is going to be called. It's called dream builders. We're building dreams in the lives of the next generation. And so I want you to be prepared for that. Pray into that. Next Sunday, I'm taking your thunder this morning, Pastor Susanna. Next Sunday is Empowerment Sunday with Pastors Mark and Tammy. It's been an incredible time. He's been sharing what the Lord's put on his heart for our church. He's bringing a message to our church. He will talk Sunday morning a little bit about Extend, our third word. And then following that, I'm starting a new series that the Lord downloaded to me. And the very first message in that series is going to be called Misfits. I think if we were to evaluate each one of our lives, we'd probably fit that word pretty good. Don't fit into the system. Don't fit in this way. Don't fit in that way. And I think so many times it's been a negative word. But I think it's actually a prophetic word for this house. We're not going to fit where everyone else is fit. We're misfits. That old Rudolph Island of Misfit Toys. But the king gives them identity and purpose. Anyways. If we could prepare communion this morning. If we could get that ready. As they get that ready, we're going to take care of tithes and offerings right now. I want to spend some time with 
I guess I'm making the ushers do double work. They're going to pass out communion, then you're going to pass in your offering. That's how we'll do it. Hallelujah. Um, I really want to challenge us this year to take faith to another level when it comes to giving. I'm not going to ever stand up here and tell you, well, if you sow $1,000, you're going to get blah, blah, blah. That's witchcraft. It's manipulation. I'm never going to do that. What I'm going to tell you is this. If you'll increase your faith, he meets you where your faith is. If you'll begin to stretch, Isaiah 54, take those tent pegs, stretch them out a little bit further. Make some room for God to move more in your life. Amen? I'm believing this year that in in the year, we'll see that building paid off. I'm believing in this year that we're going to see some incredible miracles. I'm believing that in this year, we're going to see a revival cry stirred up in this house. I'm believing that in this year, we're going to see God move in our lives in a fresh dimension. Can I have communion, please? Thank you. But before we take communion this morning, I want to encourage us to give. I almost said, can we put the slide up? We can't do that. In just a moment, I'll have Hector and Susanna come and lead us through communion. But this morning, as we, as we give, I'm reminded of the verse that says, you know, blessed is the man with a quiver full. The children are a blessing. They're arrows. As we're sowing, we're sowing into arrows because they're going to go way further than we ever could. They're, they're going to go beyond us. That's what the next gen does. goes beyond us. Listen, if you don't love Gen Z and all you have is critical words to say about them, you need to repent. If all you can do is criticize millennials because they don't fit the mold of the last generation, you need to repent. The children of Israel walked around the desert for 40 years because they couldn't embrace what God was doing. I think we've seen so much ick in the church because we haven't known how to embrace the next generation. I'm not talking about their sin. I'm not talking about sin culture. I'm talking about lives that God wants us to embrace. So this morning, we're going to pray over the offering. Buckets are going to come around. We're going to believe God to move in Gen Z. Spirit of God, I pray this morning for this offering. I pray for the lives of this house, God. And I pray that, Father, you would pour out a revival cry amongst our people, God. And that, Father, even as we prepare to sow in a couple weeks into this new building behind us, Father, I pray that you would stir up faith in this place. God, you've been so faithful. You have been so, I mean, God, I can't describe your faithfulness. You're so good. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome and thanks for tuning into this week's life-changing message from the Equipping Church. My name is Pastor Jacob Biswell and I have the wonderful privilege of leading the Equipping Church here in Bryan, Texas, where we exist to win the lost and equip the saved. By tuning in this week, we have a couple of hopes for you. That number one, you'd encounter the Lord, that you'd be equipped by his word, and then you would take that word and extend his kingdom wherever you go. For more information, you can visit us online at www.equippingchurch.us. Thanks and God bless you. We hope to see you in person soon.